Hello again everyone, it's me, Matmus. Thank you for being here on today's video. We're talking about tank and armor mobility, and a question that many people ask me and have requested for me to talk about many times on my channel is electric capable tanks, i.e. the mobility of tanks being replaced by heavy diesel smoke inducing engines to a more clean slash hybrid type engine that allows the vehicle to operate purely either on electric or a hybrid of both gasoline and electric. Now, at first glance, this idea may seem a bit ridiculous. How could one adapt a relatively new technology for the most part that's been used in electric cars into a tank and why? Well, let's take a look. First of all, the electric car technology is for certainly not new. It's very old, in fact, almost exactly as old as the combustion engine itself. It made sense in a way, compared to a combustion engine, that electric motor is quite simple in its basic design. We are talking, however, about the late 19th century, and as you can imagine, the use of such cars was extremely limited, and more of the curiosity than anything else. Electricity, however, made its way into mass transportation, mostly by the means of various combined drives, such as petroelectric and diesel electric cars. A diesel electric system is quite simple. A diesel engine powers an electric generator, which in turn powers the electric motors that move the vehicle. Its main advantage is that it theoretically does not need a gearbox and a clutch, as electric motors revolutions per minute can be controlled by simply adjusting the power to them. The downside though is the weight and size of the system, effectively restricting it to a large platform only such as marine ships or locomotives that we use to this day. Naturally, the military, always aware of funding of these new technologies, couldn't stay away from the first attempts to use a petroelectric or dieselectric system that appeared as nearly as early as the First World War. Dieselectric submarines became the gold standard of the branch until the appearance of nuclear propulsion, due to the fact that while diesel engines needed air to operate, the electric one did not, and a submarine could therefore operate underwater for a very limited time. On the ground, things were a lot more complicated. Some very early tanks during World War I period, and even after the war, were tested with this kind of drive system, but all of them generally suffered from serious reliability issues, and the system was not deemed practical when compared to more conventional engines, even though the potential ability to simply reversing the electric motor polarity in order to make one or both tracks move backwards would make for an excellent trait in track vehicles of the future, allowing it not only to turn on the spot, or neutral steering, but also to retreat very fast. You know, for the remainder of the 20th century, going beyond the First and Second World Wars, electric mobility became practically restricted to small cities due to the high price and limited range of such vehicles. However, since the 2000s, a lot of money has been funneled into electric mobility research, partially out of its urban practicality, but mostly out of environmental concerns, be them rational or not. From pretty much any wide population point of view, full-scale implementation of electric mobility is an impractical thing that few really want and is pushed, especially in places like China and Europe, for other regions of course. But what about the military? Could they be interested in having electric armoured vehicles? The answer to this question is not simple, and can be roughly summed up as... perhaps. Private companies such as BAE are already heavily working on testing such hybrid solutions for both existing and future vehicles. But when the layers of the corporate talk and buzzwords are peeled off, what remains is little substance, and the, you know, improvements that are being compared to the current generation of fossil fuel engines on its own is... definitely something to be, you know, <laughs> something to be really considered here, because I think a lot of research has gone into making these kind of drives, but implementing them is a different story. One has to look at the big picture to really notice the significant differences. As far as an individual vehicle is concerned, military electric motors, just like their civilian counterparts, offer better response, instant surge of power, potential ability to retreat very fast, and improved acoustics. At the expense of potential range, costs, reliability, and maintenance issues, though. As far as the advantages are concerned, have you ever really attended a car event where a Tesla would out-accelerate pretty much every sports car? Same thing, electric motors provide incredible amounts of instant power, which would, in tracked vehicles, translate into a major increase in agility and acceleration. Military technology is, in general, an extreme one, where even now peaks are acquired during combat at the expense of lifespan. After all, what good is an engine that can last thousands of kilometers when a tank gets knocked out after a few minutes in combat? It's not like these things are flying down the autobahn for the next 3,000 miles to get the best fuel efficiency. Agility and power are always good to have, though, in battle. The more, the better. The other advantages, however, are not as major as it might seem. The ability to drive very fast in reverse is not very practical due to the fact the driver often doesn't really see to the back of the vehicle. 
cameras are well and good, but you can't expect to seriously want to drive a 50-ton tank like that of any significant period of time in reverse. Such an action would extremely be potentially dangerous to the crew, the vehicle, and most importantly to the surroundings around you. As for the improved acoustics part, it simply means that the vehicle runs on electricity quite quietly. This is actually a considerable advantage though, for various lighter wheeled vehicles tasked with scouting duties, as the US Army has already experimented with such hybrid drives. Big tanks however, considering their size, the sheer magnitude of a tank going across the battlefield just with the tracks alone would create quite a bit of sound. On the other hand, heavy tracked vehicles, such as tanks and IFEs, really do negate the advantage totally. The sounds that they produce, whether it be the tracks, or even the turrets and the hydraulics, they can be heard from a long distance, as well as the dust they kick up and their heat signatures. There are various means of reducing those as well, such as heat masking, camouflaging, or sound mufflers, but it doesn't change the fact that such vehicles are inherently not supposed to be stealthy. Then there are the disadvantages. First, and the most obvious one of course, the potential limited range. Although this is not as big as a problem as one might think, at least not for IFEs and tanks. We're talking about a 30 to 50 ton vehicle after all. Adding a few tons of batteries really isn't a huge problem for a normal car, but for a tank, not at all that much. Here's however where things start to go a little sideways. Modern lithium ion battery capacities lie somewhere in the region of 250 to 300 watt kilograms. Now, let's take a modern 30 ton fighting vehicle, for example. Let's say it has an engine consumption of 300 kilowatts, and let's assume that we want to range as far as a Bradley IFE has, approximately about 400 kilometers, and that the average speed of such a vehicle is 50 kilometers an hour. In other words, it needs eight hours to reach it, which means supplying it with a 300 kilowatt for eight hours, ergo is 2,400 kilowatt hours. Using the 300 value, such batteries would have to weigh a whopping eight tons. That's a lot of weight, and it will only get bigger with the power consumption of a 1,500 horsepower tank class engine. Those of you who follow general aviation and general AFV news, they know that there's a lot of trends developing in terms of light armor being deployed from the sky, whether it be, you know, parachuting tanks, or just light armor with the same protection levels as the larger vehicles overall, by adding more composite plates to the MBTs. Adding a giant heavy battery to the tank that is already deemed to be too heavy doesn't really help in this regard. In comparison, the Bradley, with its old Cummins engine, carries around 700 litres of diesel fuel, which translates to roughly 600 kilograms. And of course, there's the matter of where would you even put such a battery? You can't replace the vehicle's fuel tanks, they're much smaller. Combat vehicles are generally size restricted in order to comply with the available means of transportation. One does not simply make them bigger. As a result, there would be likely less space inside than there already is right now. There are further negative implications of having battery powered vehicles, but I think what I've given so far suffices as an example. Which really brings us to the second problem. How does one such charge these massive batteries? Aside from being extremely slow to charge, an average 22 kilowatt car charger takes several days to charge the 8 ton battery, with the top of the line military chargers reaching power of around 350 kilowatt hours. There is obviously the matter of producing enough power to charge anything, aside from powering the military base itself, of course. Electric infrastructure is notoriously vulnerable, or in such places such as Afghanistan, it's lacking altogether. So all the required power would have to be generated by the military, and pretty much the only viable way to do so in large quantities would be to use direct diesel generators. That in turn means that the often cited advantage of having electric vehicles in the military, that no fuel would have to be hauled around, is completely an illusion. That is not to say that fuel costs are not a problem. In Afghanistan, around 50% of the entire military transportation capacity was taken by fuel transports, and given the dangers of attacks and required transport protection, the cost of a single liter of military JP-8 fuel rose to 85 US dollars. So would it really save on fuel transportation? I don't think so. The fuel economy of a Bradley is approximately 1.7 miles per gallon, which translates roughly to 140 litres of fuel per 100 kilometres. For 400 kilometres, the vehicle would therefore consume an average of 600 to 560 litres of fuel, and the US Army currently uses a wide range of diesel generators, including a 240 kilowatt hour and one GMG system that can actually push up to about 300 kilowatt hours, and let's assume that the above mentioned hypothetical IFE requiring 2,400 kilowatt hours to move the same distance will be getting charged with a 200 kilowatt charger. 
That translates into 12 hours of charging, ignoring all system losses for the sake of example. A full load 200 kilowatt generator consumption is roughly 50 liters of fuel per hour. Charging the vehicle in this configuration would therefore require 600 liters of fuel, which is more than a Bradley would consume on its own. In reality, an infrastructure with large generators would have to be built, and it would be obviously a lot less fuel and economically efficient than just using the engines inside the vehicle itself. There are other considerations to think of as well. You can pour some fuel into a can, but electrical energy cannot be easily transported. At these power levels, maintenance and repairs of such systems are no joke and cannot be handled in the field. They also require specialists and particular equipment to do so, whether it be fault electrical finding that need heavy duty charging systems to verify whether or not it's fully charged, uh, high voltage systems that can kill someone. Batteries also require some elements such as lithium and cobalt, which are not only finite, but also very difficult to produce. Cobalt is especially problematic, with most of it being mined in a rather turbulent area of the world, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which isn't exactly good for strategic needs of Western militaries. Furthermore, the development and procurement costs of such technology would also be extremely high, and even though the advanced militaries across the world are used to the taxpayer footing pretty much any of the bill, it would be incredibly tough for any politician to sell such a program to his or her constituents. And yet it seems that this is already happening. The American Department of Defense promised to use renewable sources for 25% of its energy it yearly consumes. This is quite the promise considering that its energy bill costs around 20 billion US dollars each year and the electricity consumption alone equals that of half a smaller European country. On the operational side of things, the US military specifically is talking about its electrical future already, with some of its representatives predicting that by the 2030s, some brigade combat teams will already be fully electric thanks to the adoption of a new generation of fighting vehicles, including the NGCV. This shift is mostly justified by the need to reduce fuel consumption of the military, with a single brigade combat team, roughly 4,000 men strong, consuming as less as 7,500 litres of fuel per operational day. While a large-scale deployment of such vehicles is very unlikely for the near future, it seems that the future of the US Army, at least, might be electric indeed. Whether the other countries follow suit remains to be unseen. So that's it for today, folks. Hope you learned a little bit about why electric vehicles may not be as practical as people think for big heavy-duty armored fighting vehicles. I'm not saying it's not going to be a thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't be advocating for it. But I think the practicality of electric systems right now just isn't there. We don't have the technology to recharge and produce these vehicles at cost that is going to supersede using engines. I'm sorry, we're just not there yet. I think maybe in 20, 30 years time when you know, batteries are refined a lot more and we can find more renewable resources to create batteries and the cost of them comes down, then yeah, maybe there's some technology that we can use to figure out to recharge them even better in, in that time period. I don't know, but I think as of right now, I think the discussion of electric or hybrid type vehicles in a operational or combat environment for armored fighting vehicles, we're just not quite there yet. And uh, I, I really would like to see more development on, on this and... and you know, more progress being made, but I think we just, we got a long way to go. The future's not quite there yet. We're going to still be sticking to our beautiful diesel and gas powered engines for quite some time, bringing these armored juggernauts through along on the battlefield. Let me know what you think about this particular topic. I know many of you have asked about it for quite some time now, so it's now here's your time to vent or to counteract my discussion here in today's video. If you enjoyed today's video, please leave me a like, and if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos from my channel, all you've got to do is hit that little tiny bell button by the subscribe button, click all so you can get all my videos pushed through to you. Hopefully I won't flood you with them, and you can get some new content up in the future. Thank you to everyone who has been donating and supporting towards my Patreon page. I cannot express how much that means to me to get that support from you. It's really helped me produce some new content for the channel, and potentially in the near future, or the long future, uh, push towards getting my CVRT uh, armored fighting vehicle for myself so we can push and showcase that all over the channel and make some really good content for you guys and thank you to everyone who has been contributing towards that fund anyway folks that's it for today have a great one all the best bye bye